Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. We move on to our next presentation, which will be given by by uh, Kim Solis, and there does not be any introduction as a member of the faculty of the Bank Meeting. And, and in, in a very good tradition of every Bank Meeting since 1991, Kim has a clear vision where people will go in over the next 15 years, I think. And your topic now about regenerative medicine, which is by some people considered to threaten organ transplantation. And I hope Kim will explain us whether it is a threat or not and uh, where it will take the bank process. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Thank you. So, you know, the, the questions about this talk begin with the very first word, because I, I kept thinking that the title of this talk was going to start The Bridge, and I kept sending that to uh, Alex, and he kept s removing the first word. So I realized, actually, finally, I, I accepted his view that I'm not just describing the bridge, I'm telling you, bridge. So I'm, I'm giving you a direct command. That's what Alex, who is in charge of the program, wished, and so that's what it will be. So bridge between transplantation and regenerative medicine. Now this is kind of an extension. For those of you who've been coming to Banff meetings since 2011, it's an extension of a conversation that began in my uh, after-dinner speech in 2011 where I, I spoke about uh, tissue engineering pathology as a thing that would eventually replace uh, transplant pathology. And I spoke about that again at Banff 2013. Now if this presentation seems a bit rushed to you, you can think of something exactly the opposite, which is talking about these things in a rather relaxed way over three days with new, numerous young people helping me do the talking. And that's what we did at this meeting in uh, New Orleans in mid-July. There were many prominent pathologists there, the president of the CAP and so on. But what was remarkable, of course, is there were no transplant pathologists and no transplanters. So no, no people like this audience were in that audience. So this is the first platform presentation before a transplantation audience of these ideas. And you might w wonder about uh, the phrase tissue engineering pathology. You would probably be aware because in 2015 all textbooks are digital and searchable that that phrase doesn't exist anywhere. So it's brand new and I thought it would probably be useful to put it in an article, so there is this uh, single author ar article in uh, Critical Care Medicine, which you know is, is the highest uh, ranked journal in uh, critical care, uh, talking about biomarkers uh, as, as, as one potential uh, modality that one would use in tissue engineering pathology. <coughs> But as you think about what I just said, a single author article and me talking about this, uh, you probably wonder who are the influences on this presentation we're listening to, and are those influences stable or unstable? Well, they're stable, they're very stable. So th this is the author line on the article that we're writing on exactly what I'm talking to you about now. And it's a very stable author line. There's not contention for who's at the end or who, what, what the author order is. There's the potential for one other junior author, by which I mean somebody below age 30. But otherwise, this is what the author line will be. So are those the only influences? Not at all, because I, I teach a course on technology and the future of Medicine, Osmar Zayan, who you've just heard from, also teaches in that course. And in that course, we have three regenerative medicine experts who lecture by Skype highly successfully. And they have also obviously taught me along with teaching the students. So a lot of their uh, ideas are also coming out in this presentation. 
So you may wonder about terms here. You've heard the term regenerative medicine, tissue engineering, and cell therapy. And they all pretty much mean the same thing. Cell therapy is less specific. But you can see from Google Trends that the persisting term that's just about remained constant over the past seven years is regenerative medicine. That term is as popular today as it was in 2005. Whereas tissue engineering has gone down a bit, uh, cell therapy has gone up. And you may be wondering, um, is this important? Because, uh, you know, when somebody talks to you about something new, you think, do I need to learn that? And so the question of whether you need to learn it has to do with whether it's important. And I think it probably is important. Current transplant protocols reach fewer than 10% of those who need that therapy. And tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, holds the promise of being able to reach the remaining 90%. And that's over 1 million people per year. So that means, however you want to look at it, medically, politically, uh, economically, this is important. A hundred, I, I, I'm sorry, one million people a year is substantial enough. It would increase the whole dynamic of you know, investment in this field. And is it just something in the future? Like when, when I talked to the president of the CAP at this meeting in uh, New Orleans about uh, when all the computing devices surrounding him in, in his workday are going to wake up and say, hey, why don't you let me do it now? Asked him when he thought that would happen. And he said, oh, not, not in my lifetime. So most of you are probably thinking that this is also not in your lifetime, but you're wrong because with tubular organs, simple tubular organs, which are actually pretty important, even though they are simple and tubular, it's happening right now. So with bladder, trachea, esophagus, vagina, th those things can be produced with stem cells right now today. And what's the importance then of tissue engineering pathology? Well, you can bet when one of these important organs is produced by stem cells and something goes wrong, it breaks or it's obviously much more fragile than the normal organ or it doesn't work right, then people are going to be very, very interested in why and how to fix it. So it's not just with complex organs like the kidney, the liver, um, the pancreas, the heart, that the, this tissue engineering pathology is important. It's also important with the organs that are being generated through regenerative medicine right now today, where it is almost routine to do so. And so you might say, well, gee, you know, we happen to know that all the major cities in Canada, except for one, are on the US map. And Dr. Solis, we discovered you have come from the one city that's off the US map that we regard as being kind of an obscure place, and therefore, is there anything important going on in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada? And so we are one of the few centers that is studying the viocyte encapsulated uh, pancreatic progenitor cells as a way of replacing uh, insulin in uh, diabetes. So the clinical trials for that are, have already started. and. Uh, it's very active, it's, it's exciting, it's going on now. For those of you who are completely kidney focused, and it's a terrible personal flaw to have to be terribly kidney focused, but if you are that way and can't help it, you might be interested to know that there will be clinical trials of the bioengineered kidney in 2017, in two years. <clears throat> so it's really happening now. It's not just a thing of the future. And is it all good? Maybe you think, from my presentation thus far, that stem cells are something totally positive that's going to revolutionize medicine, fix all problems, and are just great.
But there's also the other side, and that is stem cell hype and stem cell tourism. The greatest problem that the FDA has right now today is sports stars and uh, celebrities going to clinics, get poorly documented stem cell therapy, and then all their fans and all their adherents want to do the same thing. And so the possible, possible harm to the public that can come from that is very great. It's the FDA's biggest problem. And stem cell hype is also an enormous problem. Any article you read about stem cell therapies in the lay press is likely more positive than the data would really support. So th this is an enormous problem. And once again, you might surprise you that we have anybody with an important role to play, but actually the best person is the head of our Health Law Institute at the University of Alberta, an outstanding speaker, Timothy Caulfield, and this is the main focus of his career at this time of his life. And what about you? How does this affect you? Well, most of you in this room are affected by these three looming problems. You may be affected by all three, but you're all affected by at least one of these three looming problems. <laughs> The first is the loss of luster in the transplantation field. And you know that there have been articles in very good journals written about this loss of luster. There isn't any question about whether it's occurring. It is occurring in every way you might measure it. The best and the brightest young people are no longer entering the field and, and uh, the fewer candidates for faculty positions and on and on and on. The second is the workforce problems in kidney medicine. At, at first it seemed like there were no North American young people going into kidney medicine and then it seemed like there are no young people from anywhere in the world who want to go into kidney, kidney medicine and that's a pretty serious problem. And the third problem is technological unemployment in medicine due to machines becoming smarter than we are. This is predicted to happen on an individual basis in 2029, which is pretty darn soon. Um, and the idea is that machines will be smarter than the whole aggregate human race in 2045. And you'll probably all be alive in 2045. You think you won't, but you don't know what's going on with le longevity. Longevity is increasing. So the things I'm talking about today, all the things I'm talking about today, you will witness. They'll be a part of your life, a part of your career. They are not fantasy, they're not just the future. And so I've, this is kind of a joke, but I think there is some truth to it, that there'll come a time when almost every human being is on permanent vacation, with the exception of nephrologists and kidney pathologists. <laughs> because our problems are so challenging that robots will never be able to get it right, so our jobs are secure. Why do you think I keep in this job? You know, I have so many other options. Why do I stick to what I do? That's the reason. There's job security. So, I am not going to speak very much about the general background of the Banff uh, classification. Dr. Mengel did that very well. There are re review articles written about it, so on. You don't need to hear that from me. You, you heard about the large number of high profile AJT articles that derive from the Banff process. What may interest you is the fact that the number of articles per year continues to go up. You might think with something in, from 1991 that would gradually tail off and, you know, become more and more boring with time. And it doesn't seem like that's happening. It looks like this year, 2015, will exceed all previous years in terms of the number of Banff-related articles. And then if you think about what I'm talking about today, having a Banff classification of tissue engineering pathology, that will probably increase the articles. So this curve will, will go up even farther in the future. Now, Doris Taylor, who unfortunately can't be here today, when this article came out on the front cover of the AJT in November 2014, it stopped a lot of you in your tracks. Prior to that time, you thought that regenerative medicine was something of the future and you didn't really have to worry about it. There were a lot of short... You know, a lot of people are like politicians. They're really only interested 
in the short term future until the next election and that's it. And a lot of you are normal people, I can tell just by looking at you, and so that's your interest. Your interest in the future in the next three or four years, not too much beyond that. This suggested that regenerative medicine, at least in the heart, is happening right now, today. And the heart's a pretty important organ. The uh, you know, energy requirements of the heart, I, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but for each myocyte, you need a capillary. You need a capillary per myocyte. That, that's because the energy requirements are so high. So we, we in the kidney world can be proud that we have the, like the most complex organ and regenerative medicine replacement of the kidney is like the moonshot because you have to get everything in the right order. But it may actually be that the, the complete regenerative medicine replacement of the heart is slightly more impressive than the regenerative me medicine replacement of the kidney because it's possible that the kidney would still work if you don't get quite all the cells in the right places and everything in quite the right order, it, it still might work. Um, so this, I, I think, and the fact that it appeared on the cover of the best transplantation journal began to suggest that you could no longer exclude this from your thinking about what is a part of your career today. This was kind of here, it's now, it's happening now. And so suddenly, tissue engineering pathology went from being something, you, you know those cop shows on uh, TV where, where the police tell the crowd to move along, nothing to see here. Move along, nothing to see here is the way tissue engineering pathology was between 1967 when the first art article was written until now. Because most of it is just tissue reaction to scaffolds. Successful scaffolds don't have any tissue reaction, so it's a really boring pathology. But now there's real clinical consequence to the abnormalities one can find in stem cell generated organs, in the organs that have had stem cells added to uh, ex vivo repair, uh, ex vivo perfusion. So it suddenly, I think in 2015, it, it warrants its own separate pathology discipline. So that's what I'm arguing that, that we would have from 2015 on, and that it would be an important part of your lives in the future. And if you think it means learning things completely different from what you currently think about, I don't think so. It, it's kind of the world you know a little bit backwards, that in, instead of worrying about the cells that accumulate in a transplanted organ, you're trying to get the cells that should be in a function functioning organ to actually be there in the right sequence and, and in the right circumstances so the organ can actually function. You're worried about the inflammatory reaction. So many of the things are similar to, to, to what you already encounter in, in re regular allograft transplantation. But it starts with cells and a scaffold and bioactive factors, putting those all together to give you a tissue engineered construct. You will sense in yourself resistance to this. And I sense that. So that's why I have this slide. I asked Lynn uh, Cornell whether I should take the slide out. She said, no, leave it in. <laughs> so anyway, but it gives the, the idea that you are naturally resistant to the ideas here. But I think they can be o overcome and you need to start practically considering this. The world is changing where all these processes, attachment, proliferation, migration, differentiation, remodeling, vascularization, you need to consider this for generating organs, for repairing organs, for ex vivo perfusion, uh, correction of defects in organs that are not suitable to be transplanted now, but give a few days of therapy ex vivo, and they will be. And getting the sequence right, putting in the right cells at the right time. These are all important, but they're related enough to what you already do, what you already know how to do, what you already learned in your training and in medical school that it's not going to be a burden for you. It 
will be exciting to, to add this to your current work life. <clears throat> Do Canadians want this? You're in Canada. I don't know if you noticed that, but you crossed the border, many of you, and you're, you're now in this kinder, gentler nation of Canada, Western civilization at its peak, but we're just really boring because we don't start wars, we're not, you know, aggressive. So Canadians want this. There, there is evidence that Canadians as a group are in favor of regenerative medicine. They want to see it happen. And so this picture of a pink organ turning white when you put in detergent and you wash out all the cells and then turning pink again when the stem cell generated cell mass begins to proliferate. This will become very familiar to you. You'll be wonder, wondering whether you cross species, how severely injured that organ can be and still be a successful scaffold, and a lot of other things like that. This is going to be quite an important consideration in your future. And so when I talked about the technological singularity in general, which is the point when machines are smarter than we are, the technological singularity in transplantation is really when this routinely begins to happen. When a patient needs an organ and this process of, of creating one from their own cells is the first thing that you think about, then that's when the transplantation singularity will have happened. So is this magic? Do the cells know exactly where to go? Do they know how to differentiate and, and with what time course? Well, it's very interesting that things go wrong. Podocytes, the, the, these cells that are meant to cover the external surface of glomerular capillaries in animal models, in, in the rat model, the, the, the article by Song et al., uh, those podocytes go wandering in the interstitium, somewhere they, they've never been before. There are a bunch of other cell types that are just not there. And when you look at tubules, let me see if I can go ahead to that. Yeah, so, my goodness. Yeah, here, this is a disordered tubule. So it has multiple lumina, they're intercommunicating, uh, would fluid pass through there? Is it patent? It's sort of hard to tell. And you, you can see there's a completely empty interstitium, no cells in the inter interstitium. And down there at the bottom is, um, is a glomerulus with may, way fewer nuclei. So if you're critical of this, you can say, can you call this a kidney? But what are you going to call an organ that has glomeruli and tubules? I mean, yeah, it's still a kidney. And rather than criticizing it and calling it names and saying, can you call this a kidney? You could use the special skill that you possess to help us more quickly move this part of medicine forward, move this part of anatomical pathology forward, and make this routine part of clinical practice. So we no longer are just transplanting 10% of the patients who need it, but with tissue engineering transplantation and tissue engineering pathology, we could reach every single patient. Initially, like everything else, this would be expensive. But you can imagine as it scales up that the cost would go down. That is what has always happened with everything else. That is what will happen here. So whereas initially we cannot afford to have this go out to everybody, eventually we should have that as our goal. So um, you, you can look at uh, analogies. The uh, analogy I, I like to use here, so we're starting something brand new. If, if you think of what I, would, I did in 91, do you know Ken Porter? Ken Porter was the transplant pathologist who wrote the transplant pathology chapters in Dr. Heptonstall's textbook, the first three editions. 
And long before there was a Bob Colvin or Kim Solez, there was Ken Porter, and he knew a heck of a lot about transplant pathology. So in 1991, we sort of codified, we, 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 we put together existing knowledge, but it really wasn't brand new. In a sense, this uh, tissue engineering pathology is something that is brand new. And I liken it to 1851. You notice this building, it's London's Crystal Palace. It looks a lot like our hospital. Our hospital is this glass-lined thing with huge atria. The two buildings are very similar. This at the time was the largest glass-lined building in, in the world. And it burned down and is being rebuilt in 2016. Um, but in 1851, they, they, they had uh, an exhibition of new technologies. And they included the International Classification of Diseases, ICD. And it's kind of an odd thing, maybe, maybe to, but it was a really big deal. It's the first time ever that that classification had been talked about. And what is it oriented around? It's oriented around death and death and death and the causes of death and how people die and death here, death there. It's all death, death, death. And so what I, I thought was different about tissue engineering pathology as I regard it is we're talking about life. What organs, what compromises an organ structure I mean, when, when we're looking at a kidney that's got funny tubules, funny glomeruli, that we think it might not work perfectly, will it work well enough to support life? Can it work long term? This working out of what will support life it is, I, I think, the orientation around this tissue engineering pathology. And so the idea then, <laughs> Now that it's become exciting is we start writing about it in 2015, and, but how do we make the actual classification? I, I think that is an important work of the next two meetings and maybe the meeting beyond. So the meeting in 2017 in Spain, I, I would think this would be part of the focus and the meeting in 2019, currently scheduled for Turkey um, and perhaps 2021. So um, the, the author names that I, that I showed you on slide three, obviously there'll be a lot more players in the long run, in, including some very skilled people that we haven't met yet, who are in the kind of physics part of this as opposed to the medicine part. So in our lo original location, we had deer poking their heads into the meeting rooms. We've come a long way. Please help us in this transition to the future. If with this uh, short presentation today, if you're really missing the three, three days in uh, New Orleans, I, I could share that with, with you. But I mean, come talk to me if, 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 if you're interested in learning more, more about this. I'm not hard to find at this meeting. And uh, we are very grateful to the Roche Organ Transplantation Research Foundation, which funded the first three years, the uh, infrastructure from 2013 to 2016 of the Banff Foundation. So in the progress reports to them, what I've just talked to you about is the main thing that we have described doing. And, and it was very pleasing that I wrote a progress report about that. And the money and the approval came back almost instantly, where the two previous years have been lengthy delays. Um, so we, we are very grateful to them, and I think there, there are ways to build on their three years of support to get uh, sustained support forever. Now the last slide, I, I wanted to tell you that all my presentations on this meeting are on the slide share site. My username there is ksolez, so if you just do slideshare.net slash ksolez, be able to find all the presentations. Not only my presentation, but also uh, Doris Taylor. She called me on Friday and told me that unfortunately she had this uh, acute event in her health and she was unable to come. 
And so I said at that time that I would give her talk here, but I'm not going to do that because we're running quite seriously late and the anxiety in all of you guys would rise to an unconscionable level if, we, if I gave her talk. Uh, so I'm not going to do that, but she has, like I have, a lot of videos. So you, you, can, uh, so you can go into SlideShare and, and click on these links and watch her on video. And you can also see her whole talk, which has videos within it with sound. So, so it, it, it's quite nice what she had prepared for us. So ladies and gentlemen, that's my talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I remind you that there's a coffee break after this, and probably your biology needs coffee about this time of the day. Any questions? <clears throat> Right. I, I completely agree, and uh, we're, we're not making any presumptions about what the predominant modality of, of examination will be. I think that, you know, it has to be anatomically, uh, it, anatomically correct, um, and anatomical pathology based, but it could end up being mainly routine sampling for biomarkers once you had proved what those uh, biomarkers went, meant in the, in the encapsulated pancreas. You can't simply go into the capsule. That sort of ruins the whole thing. But you can Im easily sample the fluid. So you, you could sample the fluid as, as often as you wanted. So it's going to be different. It's not all tissue on a slide. It's not all traditional light microscopy, but I, I, I think we um, face a very exciting future and to a much greater extent that was true than was true in 1991, we are indeed starting something brand new today. So I, I hope you're excited about that as I am. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. <clears throat>